And as a little boy who grew up in Rochester, Minnesota, in a neighborhood full of doctors and engineers and daddies and mommies that, you know, actually loved their kids, it was tough. And so I, I became angry and I didn't understand, you know, you just don't get it. You can't grok that your daddy doesn't love you when you're eight. When you are 30 years old, upside down, broke, and when you're a young man who has attributed all of his self-worth and esteem and character to a job and a paycheck and a German car and an overpriced suit, I didn't have anything to touch. Every decision I make today is framed within my little boys and my wife. What does it mean to them and how is it going to affect them? And that's a really cool transition. It is a really cool transition. And that's the story that unfolds in this episode. So here we go. This is the show dedicated to raising up the next generation of men of faith and character. My name is Mark Stanifer. Welcome to The Next Men Up. Part of the NRT Podcast Network. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the Next Man Up podcast. So good, as always, to have you join us for another episode and to be part of the community that is changing the world by being and raising healthy and godly men. I am Mark, and I'm excited to bring you another episode again today. My guest today is Joey Dumont, and because Joey is a storyteller, both by professional trade and by the things that he's doing outside of that professional career, I'm just going to read you some excerpts from his About page on his website, website, because I think they will capture better than I could who you are about to hear. My name is Joey and I am a recovering douchebag. I used fashion, discourse, athletics, and other personas to manage a public appearance of physicality, status, expertise, and productivity. After all, when a man looks good and speaks well, little else matters, right? Again, this is from Joey's About page. However, within every insecure and arrogant male resides a scared little boy demanding attention. And if I was ever going to experience the true fullness of life, a shift was needed. My pretentious parade would have to end. You see, I managed to marry a woman who saw beyond my facade and was the catalyst to my recovery. When we started a family, she had no intention of raising our two boys alongside another little boy. I had no choice but to retool. It was time to grow up, sit on a therapist's couch for eight years, and evolve for my family. I finally dared to deal with my chronic anxiety, episodic depression, and other neuroses I was too ashamed to admit. And then I wrote about it. Joey and I had a fun conversation, even in the midst of the the difficult traumatic childhood stories that he shares and the the mistakes in his adult life that he made along the way. He's got a sense of humor and a, a, a strong sense of self-awareness at this point in life. And it was fun to just uh, to listen to him chronicle his journey from childhood to where he is now and, and the good place that he is after this recovery period. So without further ado, let's get to Joey Dumont and the life and times of a recovering douchebag. Here we go. Well, Joey, it's a pleasure to talk to you today, man. I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, giving us a bit of your time. I'm excited to to see where this conversation goes and, and how it unfolds. Well, thanks, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. So you've got a crazy story. A crazy story. And we'll unpack yeah. some of that as we go, um, as much as time allows. But I, I wondered if we could start with just simply this question. You recently wrote the book, Joey Somebody. And tell me why. Tell me why Why the book. What was the inspiration? Why now for, uh, for capturing your story in book form? Sure. I, <clears throat> I lost one of my best friends to, to a car accident in 2017. And he was my best friend growing up and my older brother's best friend until the day he died. 
and his wife called me and asked me if I would deliver the eulogy. <clears throat> and I said, sure, honey. And she said, can you make it Joey funny? Can, <laughs> can you make the church laugh? It's a dark day. And, and I just want people to forget about the pain for a bit. And I said, sure. And so Jay was a, my buddy who got was killed was a, a molecular biologist educated at the Mayo Clinic, played on his soccer team for his church. He was one of the, one of the good ones, if you will. And he had two kids, 19 and 21. So they got to know who he was. They knew he was a medical clinician. They knew he was kind, uh, God-fearing man. They knew he was a wonderful husband. His wife, Jolene, uh, was his first date in high school. And wow. he was her first date and they fell in love and they got married right after high school before they went to college even. And so it was a wonderful romance and it was just a tragic loss for the whole family. And the best way I can encapsulate why I wanted to make it funny to, to Joe's request was, you know, talk about his intelligence and how wonderful he was as a human being. And as I sat down to write this eulogy, <clears throat> I realized that my little boys at the time were six and four. And if this same fate would to befall me, I, they wouldn't know who I was. Mm. And all they would hear from my buddies is that, oh, your daddy was a, you know, a great guy. He was your coaches and, and he loved you and he loved your mommy. And he was an ad guy and he had a lot of, a lot of fun in that career. And you know, the, the good stuff, right. But they wouldn't understand how I grew up. And that was kind of where the memoir came from. I wanted my little boys to understand that even their heroes are vulnerable. Mm. That's how I wanted them to kind of see the world. I wanted to frame our existence that way. And because of that, then they would be like, wow, daddy, I didn't understand, you know, you until I read your book. And it's pretty dark. It's a, it's a heavy book. My dad was a sociopath and he did a lot of really bad stuff to our family. And my little brother's death by depression was in part caused by my father's abuse. <clears throat> and so it's not a book that they can read, you know, anytime soon. But the idea was when they get to be in their, you know, let's just say high school, uh, they can, they can absorb the book and understand their daddy a little better. And in doing so, they can understand themselves a little better in their lineage and kind of how they want to frame the world differently than I did. So one of the things that I often, I often ask or try to draw out when I'm talking to somebody in this context is how their father impacted them. And you, you, categorize lots of different stories in, in the book. And one of your comments that, that stood out to me, I, I wonder if you could react to, was this relatively early on. You say, you say this, something in me was so wounded about growing up without a father that I was unable to care about anyone else, only me, the definition of selfish. I blamed mom, I blamed dad, I blamed the world. None of this was my fault. We know fathers have a significant impact on us. Talk about the impact that yours, yours had on you. Well, I think the hardest part about abuse from a parent is that just at a biological level, you trust your parents and you, you look to your parents to help you and to protect you and to love you and to give you discipline and guidance. And when that parent does the opposite, when they leave, uh, without returning. And then when they do return, they are spiteful and narcissistic and selfish and mean spirited. It's a, it's really difficult to understand. And so for my dad, when he split, when we were kids, he came back and visited us 10 days a year. And he thought that was magnanimous. Hmm. And he would let us know how lucky we were to be in his presence for 10 days a year. And as a little boy who grew up in Rochester, Minnesota, in a neighborhood full of doctors and engineers and daddies and mommies that, you know, actually love their kids. It was tough. And so I, I became angry and I didn't understand. And so I didn't understand this until I was an adult, actually, until I went to clinical psychologist and kind of unwound a lot of this. But, you know, you just don't get it. You can't grok that your daddy doesn't love you when you're eight. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And now I have an eight-year-old. And so it's one of those things where I have a nine-year-old as well. And so when I look at what I do as a father, you know, my, my discipline is very important. It means I love them. I'm not their friend. And I wasn't looking for a friend. 
And that's what my dad wanted to be when he came to visit us 10 mm. days a year. There was never any discipline with my father because he knew if he said something wrong that we wouldn't like him and then he didn't like not being liked because he was a narcissist. And so it taught me a lot. <clears throat> and I think that the biggest lesson that that, that specific thing happened in my life is that it, it altered my behavior in the sense that I wanted to do almost everything the opposite of my father. I wanted to be not only here, present, I wanted to be active. I wanted to be loving and I wanted to be caring and I wanted to be doting and I wanted to be the disciplinarian. I wanted them to know that I'm their father and that I care about them and I'm here to protect them and educate them. And that is a very different deal than trying to be their friend 10 days a year. So it was a one of those pieces that I just didn't really understand until I became older and kind of unpacked that at an intellectual level. The, the subtitle of your book is The Life and Times of a Recovering Douchebag, which, <laughs> yeah. and you even talk about that in, in the book and, and different reactions to that title. Um, and and th- there's lots of different examples in there of douchebag living, douchebag lifestyle. Yeah. And I'm sure our listeners can just whatever whatever your your thinking listeners that that was it, <laughs> that, that was it. And, yeah. and, and, and you yeah. do you do a great job of um, of divulging it, right? It's it's very you're very vulnerable, um, and and at the same time ma- making a comment on this didn't serve me well. You, you've no. you, you've talked about where you are today. You've talked about your kids, but I, I wonder what that. Uh, what that moment was for you that began the douchebag recovery process? Who, you know, it's a culmination of a lot of things. I think that I actually went into business with my father at the age of 30. And the quick and dirty on that is that he embezzled my money about a year into the practice and left me with the bill. So in doing so, I was upside down about six figures. I, raised money from investors, which included college buddies and my brother and, you know, my mother and other people that I asked money for in little tiny chunks. And, uh, <laughs> when you are 30 years old, upside down, broke, uh, he wasn't paying the rent that I was paying him on his condo. And so I was eventually evicted probably three weeks later, I found out I was being evicted from my home. And when you're a young man who has attributed all of his self-worth and esteem and character to a job and a paycheck and a German car and an overpriced suit, I didn't have anything to touch. Mm. And so for the first time in my life, I, I admitted I was scared. I went to my, my, my best friend Kimmy's house and I said, hey, I'm a mess. This just happened. And this super confident guy I pretend to be is a fraud and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And she sat down and gave me a hug and poured a glass of wine and they put some chocolate chip cookies in the oven and we watched a really terrible rom-com. <laughs> and uh, we, we just talked. She just listened. I, I, it was like I pierced a levee and it just it all washed off of me. And, <clears throat> and she said, honey, you need to go get some help. You, know, you need to go to a meditation center. And she, this is the first time I ever understood there was such a thing. And I live in Northern California. And uh, I went to this meditation center to understand what it meant to be present and to be peaceful. And and at the same time, I started studying spiritual texts for the first time. I reread the Bible, much to my mother's, you know, pure joy. And I read the Bhagavad Gita, and I read the Tripitaka, and I read the Vedas, mostly from the Hindu piece of it. And uh, I realized that all of these religious texts were beautiful stories that had wonderful metaphoric truths, all of which were very similar, which was to, to live a life of love and kindness and awareness of your presence with other people and that things don't matter, that, that you're not here for the things. You're not here to acquire and to be part of a consumer economy. That was not, that was not the gig. And, and that year was a very special, special time for me because I did, I began rock climbing and I did a lot of other cool things that had nothing to do with money or materialism. And it was, it was probably the most peaceful year I'd had 
up until that year. And then sadly, I uh, got another big job offer about a year later, <laughs> jumped right back into <laughs> the corporate world. And I, you know, enthusiastically reprised my role as a douchebag. And it, and I did that again for another five or six years. And I would say that in my late thirties, I found myself in a career. I, I, I was in the advertising business and, and we, you know, we sold campaigns to sell stuff. That's what ad, ad, ad agencies do. And, and I found myself surrounded by all these wonderful creative people, creative artists and um, technologists and strategists and project people. And it was just cool. And we did some really good, great work. And I really enjoyed the materialism, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> at that point. And we, you know, we didn't set out to make a lot of money, but the firm went crazy. We had, you know, mad success in the, in the corporate world. We were adding to the year in 2011, 2012. We shot a documentary that went, that went viral uh, within our industry. And so I was speaking, you know, keynote speaker at conferences all over the country. And, and uh, I, I lived that life and it was great. But I, again, got caught up in a lot of the distraction that comes with that. Uh, too much alcohol and, and a lot of carousing with women and, you know, things that felt good at the time, but they, you know, in hindsight, not the best, not the best use of your time, not the best use of, of your intellect and your, your energy. And so long winded answer there, Mark, but you know, it was a culmination. And, and when I fell in love with my wife, she was never interested in the douchebag. Yeah. And, and I mentioned that in the book that my wife hated the word even for the book. My mother would call the word dirty. And my therapist told me it was a breakthrough. Right. So it was just one of those things where I was like, I, I like the word because it, it encapsulates kind of my own definition of what it meant to be a douchebag, which was think of myself first, my hedonistic pleasures, focus on me. And what happens when you fall in love truly, which I did, and I, I still am 13 years later, I'm even more in love. I thought about her first. Mm. And then when we had our two little boys, I thought about them and every decision I make today is framed within my little boys and my wife. What does it mean to them and how is it going to affect them? And that's a really cool transition. When you go from being a douchebag to someone who cares about something other than yourself, it's a wonderful, uh, liberated existence. It's, it's a, it was a huge shift in my life. And, and ever since then, I've done everything I can. And I continue to read spiritual books you know, constantly. I just finished a wonderful book on Buddha. Um, called Old Path White Clouds, and 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 I, I continue to keep myself uh, wrapped with these wonderful texts. Uh, I just watched a lecture on Genesis, as an example, by a, a wonderful guy named Dr. Jordan Peterson, and I had enjoyed that. I I liked his translation of Genesis, and I liked what he talked about. And I think that as I got older, as I already mentioned, I like the metaphorical truths of religion. I think that they're really key for me. And again, this is just me, but I like that there's a touchstone there, that there's something I can go to for guidance. And it's, it's a piece of the book as I don't know how far you got into it, but I talk about that at length in, in chapter 13. Yeah. And I think that that's a big thing for me is that the, you realize that, you know, I'm 54 years old now and I, I had a wonderful life and a great career and, and uh, now I'm a stay at home dad uh, next year, I'm going back to work. I'm consulting again because I really miss it. And I'm going to have a lot of fun going out and talking with my media folks and helping them. I'm a leadership coach now, uh, but I'm doing it, um, you know, 15 hours a week as opposed to the 80 hours a week I was working. And uh, I, I enjoy that part. And I think that that's all part of it now is that the leadership coaching is the similar calling to me. It's the similar piece that I, I get to go out and help folks find balance in their life. And, and because I've done a good job of that demonstrably, you know, for people I know in the media world, they're like, geez, you're so much happier, man. You look good. And you look, you look like you've slept and <laughs> you know, you're like, yeah, dude, it's, it's cool. You know, there's something, there's a life out there and, and there's birds in trees. Right. And they sing. Right. You know, <laughs> and there's parks with people in them. And it's like, wow, you know, there's a whole life outside of the ad world. So you know, it's, it's been a long journey and, and I would say I'm still on it, but I'm in a, I'm in a really neat part of my life right now where I'm present way off, way more often than I used to be. I would say even, in, you know, 
over 50% of my life now in present. And that's a, that's a milestone for me. I feel like it's obviously, I hope it continues to go in the right direction, but I just think I'm doing, I'm doing good for, for the world by being present and being a good father and being a good husband and being a good member of my community. And yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of where it's at. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a, a, a fun little story when, during your rock climbing years where yeah. you roll into the rock, com, rock climbing, the indoor climbing place and, and mm-hmm. you, you park in a spot that was designated for another business in the area and the business owner is pretty adamant that you've infringed on his customer parking. And I, I wonder, I, I wonder why you wanted to include that story in the book and, and what it meant to you in that moment or a, as you're looking back on it, what it meant to you. I mean, it's a astute observation. I, I included that to show the power of presence versus the power of ego mm. and when i as you read pieces and parts of i and i didn't put it all in there but i had a really his, a bad history of fighting so i i got in a lot of fights i was in a gang when i was a kid and you know i got in a lot of trouble and uh my first reaction to life when it bit me was to bite back harder and so when i parked my truck in the parking lot that day, it was a clearly demarcated sign that said, you know, for this dry cleaner. And, and I didn't pay attention to it. I was actually in a really good mood. I mean, I was just present. I was, I had my rope, my new rope in the back and I couldn't wait to get on the wall. And so I'm just getting my gear and I see this guy just tearing out of his (laughs) dry cleaner and he's livid. Right. And he's yelling at me and calling me names. And, and it was one of the first times in my life that I didn't square off on a guy. And I just put my rope down and I put my arms down and I saw him coming. <laughs> and I, as he continued to yell, I said, oh man, I'm so sorry. I didn't see the sign. I was just excited to get on the wall. My bad, man. And, and it just, he just deflated like a dying balloon. He didn't know what to do. Yeah. And I, I, I was, as a trained fighter, I wasn't scared of him. I was just, I'm not going to hurt this dude. Like, I need to get this guy's life better right now. He's obviously having a, a tough day. And this was a trigger to whatever else is bothering him. Maybe his wife was sick. Maybe his kid was sick. Maybe he's sick. Who knows? But I need to be there for this dude. And that was not a typical reaction for me, you know? And so I chronicled it because it was so profound. The reaction that took place, that guy started to smile and he said, oh man, I'm sorry, young man. Just leave it there, man. Just leave it. Go, go climb and have a, have a great day. You know, I was almost like I wanted to hug him, and I think he almost wanted to hug me. It was just one of those things where it was just like, wow, what a cool moment. <clears throat> and I never forgot it. And you know, that's why I put it in the book. It was just it was such a cool human experience. It was just I was there for him. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. You know? Yeah. As I was reading through it, it seemed like maybe – at least in the way that you were chronicling your story, that that was a spark of, oh, there's more. There, there's more than who I used to be. There's, there's more that I could grow into. And yeah, I, I figured there, that was the, the strategy behind in, including that specific story. Yeah. And it was a part of who I became. I think it's who I am today. You know, I haven't, I haven't been in a fight since 2009 and that happened in Brazil. I got jumped at a bathroom. And uh, as a trained martial artist, it was an unfortunate thing for that guy. Mm. And my wife was livid because we just got engaged and she knew my history. And she said, you promised me you'd never fight. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't pick that fight. That yeah. guy picked the fight with me. And, yeah. and, you know, and then I, was, I started therapy after that fight because it scared my wife enough. And it scared me enough. I really hurt him. And... Uh, that was the opposite of what I did at the climbing gym that day. I let my emotions get away with me. I probably could have, I don't know. I have no idea if I could have talked my way out of it. The guy didn't speak English very well and he was really angry and wanted my money. And uh, yeah, but I, 
I never forgot either. You know, fighting is not a good thing. It hurts everybody involved, uh, physically and emotionally and spiritually. And I had to get away from that. And uh, that is exactly what that was, Mark, is that it, it was more of a, like a window into who I wanted to become yeah. as, a, as a man. And I have tried to model that, you know, specifically the last 13 years of my life since I fell in love with my wife and, and became a husband and a father. It's really important now. You know, I, I, try, I teach my kids uh, martial arts or I help them a little bit. They're not quite into the training rigor yet, but they will be someday. And, and I, the one thing I talk to them all the time about is that you, you can deflate most fights by talk. And that's the one thing that, you know, I, I was never taught that. I was taught the opposite. And so I want to do all these things because I, not only do I need to be a better human being, I need, I need to be a better human being for my kids and my wife. I enjoyed the moments that gave glimpses of, of contrast, like, like that story. And, and there was a, the, another point that, um, that you clearly made. So you had a, a love affair with clothing, fine clothing and lots of different <laughs> yeah. clothing. I think at one point you mentioned that you, you, you would never be caught wearing the same thing twice or, or something along those yeah. lines, right? Um, but at, at the time, or maybe, maybe, maybe it still is, you, your, your most favorite piece of clothing was the, the coach jacket that you got for, the, for, for your kid's school. Uh, or, or the yeah. soccer, the soccer team. It, it just seemed to me your way of saying, uh, yes, I've, I've documented who I was, but this is now who I'm becoming. And, and those things don't matter to me the way they used to, because these things I see now as much more important. Yes. And, and the, the compare and contrast is really important with writing. And my brother, who is my co-author is a is a writer. He has a master's degree in writing composition and he's a law professor and he teaches legal reasoning and writing. So he gets the writing joke. And part of what he helped me understand with the telling of my stories was exactly what you already picked up on, which was the contrast. So spending, you know, $1,700 on a custom made suit in 1993 is an egregious violation of <laughs> reason and logic, <laughs> no matter how you slice that. Uh, and you know, fast forward 20 years, 25 years, and now I'm a stay-at-home dad and I'm coaching soccer teams and baseball teams and basketball teams with two of my buddies from the school who I met at the school in kindergarten orientation. And we were all from the Midwest and we were all jocks in high school. And, and so we, when they're looking for volunteers to coach, we all signed up and we got to coach. And after the season was over, and none of us knew this. It was just a wonderful surprise was that, you know, they called up the coaches to the, to the auditorium, you know, in front of all the kids. And, and they presented us with these little blue polyester jackets with plastic snaps. I'm picturing <laughs> you know, like an FBI jacket. That, like, you it see, looks like that. Yeah. It does. Yeah. With, except without, you know, police on the back right. or ATF or whatever it is. It, right. It's just, it has the school. And then in, on the left breast pocket, it has coach you know, emblazoned upon it. And it was so amazing. It was like, we all sat there and we wore those jackets, you know, to coach. And when it was raining, they were great. And, you know, again, I think that the contrast there was that they were manufactured in bulk <laughs> for $3 a jacket, possibly. And it, it was my favorite possession because it was, it was earned. It was, it was something that I didn't, I couldn't buy in a store. It was a act of love to go out and coach these little kids, these little boys, and the love was returned. And, and then bigger than that, as I, and that's the last chapter of the book, it's called Coach Joey. Because, you know, I would go to practices, even basketball practices started at 2.40. And so I'd have to meet the little boys on the, on the playground and they would come tearing out of the building, you know, running and they'd hug my leg and Coach Joey's here and Coach Joey's here. And then, and then we'd, have the balls and they would all beg for the ball and they'd start to play. And, and I'd let them shoot for five minutes before we got the practice session going. And, and I get Valentine's, <laughs> these kids, <laughs> you know, it was just like, it was a whole life I completely overlooked and I didn't know existed. And it was just, it was absolutely wonderful. And I sadly have stopped coaching my kids now because they're getting bigger and we hired a professional coach 
my two oldest boys are on a championship soccer team now. And we hired an actual guy who played professional soccer in Senegal. And he's a fantastic coach. And I assist him when I go uh, a couple of days a week, but I'm not in charge anymore. And, and, but I still get to go out there and be with these little kids. And, and these are the same boys that I coached from kindergarten. And they're, they're now nine and 10 years old. So I spent four or five years of my life with these little, these little dudes, all of whom I love and I love the parents. And so that was a whole nother thing that happened was just this big love fest between parents that had the same ideas, the same ideologies for their children, you know, to love them and to protect them and to educate them and to discipline them. Very similar. And the coaching uh, constructs were very similar to that. You know, we were strict, firm, loving, and caring, and it worked. You know, we we put together a couple of great teams. They had a championship year uh, in second grade. Last year was canceled, obviously, for COVID, but our team won the championship in 2019. So yeah, it was fantastic. It was it was the greatest experience of my life. It really was. <laughs> Just being a coach, there's nothing better. I won't. It'll be difficult to to match that, even moving forward. One of the things you told me when when we were talking before the recording was that you had you had said to your brother. I think this is how it went. You had said to your brother that you guys are you're breaking the chains of what was what was passed on to you. Um, yeah. yeah, say, say, say more about that. I've read about this and it's breaking the chain of abuse and it's a difficult thing. So if you grow up abused in a high, you know, a home with alcoholism and cigarettes and door slamming and, and hate, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to fall back into that and, or use the same crutches. And if you start drinking and smoking and whatever you'd use to distract from your mental health, then it's pretty easy to fall into that. And I could have fallen down that path. And if there are certain things in my life that, you know, didn't go as well as they did, it, it was very, very easy for me to see myself in that position. And I have friends who grew up less than optimal, like I did, and they, they fell prey to that. And they are now doing the same thing. They're divorced and alone and sad and drinking and without their children. And, and, you know, I, I, it's, it's heartbreaking. And so for me to break the chain was to, and my brother and I, you know, cause my brother's a very active uncle, he's single. And so we've kind of adopted that, Hey, let's treat our little boys, my little boys. But I say that to him a lot. <laughs> let's, let's treat our little boys. Like we wanted to be treated. Let's be the dads that we didn't have. Let's be the, the guardian. Let's be the protector. Let's be the, the love that we wanted as kids. And that, you know, my kids are super healthy. I don't mean just, just physically, because that's a gift, but mentally they're very healthy. They are surrounded by love and affection and, and discipline and education and music and books. And, and that's, that's breaking the chain. They're going to grow up, going to read my book, give me a big hug someday and say, thanks. Thanks, dad. And I'd be like, you're welcome, guys. And what I need you guys to do is to go out and do some good in this world because you've been really privileged, you know, and I need you to pay that forward. That's my, my gift to the world is you two, you know, so go, go be kind. That's great, man. I, I don't know what it's like to walk in your shoes, but I know that it takes a lot of courage to confront what you did and to work through it and to come out on the other side of that crucible stronger and, and better. And it's super cool that you're able to now be like, I'm breaking the chains, I'm doing different, and, and I'm going to yeah. leave a better... I'm going to leave a, a, a better wake behind me for those that are coming. So good on you, man. I, um, uh, b big props for, for that decision and the courage and, and to see it through. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. My book is called Joey Somebody, The Life and Times of Recovering Douchebag. It's on Amazon. And then I, I also have a podcast called Laugh Your Cry Out, which explores everything from masculine energy to topics of the day that kind of at the intersection of important and interesting. So whether it's, I, I interviewed a young lady named Aja Radan. She wrote a book called The Truth About Lies. And my, my dad being a pathological liar, <laughs> I want to understand that a little bit more. 
And uh, I interviewed some men who've gone through some stuff and mental health and I've interviewed some psychologists and folks like that. So I'm just trying to come out there with my platform to let other people know that they're not as alone as they think they are, Mm. uh, either with their upbringing or with their emotional health. And the goal of the platform in general is just to, to explore topics that are really complex and need more of a long form content to uh, explore and, and educate and encourage debate. That's kind of what it's for. So yeah, you can find that at Laugh Your Cry Out with Joey Dubon. It's on YouTube um, and Apple and all the- Anywhere you get your podcast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, Joey, somebody, the book, Joey Dumont, the man and the <laughs> author, thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure talking with you, and uh, I wish you all the best in your continued journey to do better. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Well, there you have it, guys, the life and times of Joey Dumont. As I said in the intro, I enjoyed the conversation. We had a good time, even in the midst of all of the the pain and the abuse that that Joey was a victim of and the the craziness of the choices that he was making it was um it, it was just it was fun to listen to him chronicle his story as well as to see him where he is today fully engaged as a dad as a committed husband and uh, I wish I wish Joey and his family all the best as they they continue to grow if you're interested in the book, again, the title is Joey Somebody, Life and Times of a Recovering Douchebag. You can find a link in the show notes. And as always, if you have feedback for us, suggestions, questions, comments, we would love to hear from you. You can get us at feedback at the nextmanup.com. That's our email address. You can also find us on Facebook. We live at NMU Journey there. And if you're interested in checking out what else is going on, we've got blog with regular articles. Um, We've got a, a course that will help you in strategically and intentionally raising your son to become a man by developing a rite of passage process. And you can find all that, subscribe to our weekly emails at thenextmanup.com. Multiple ways for you to engage with us, please do so. Want to continue to build this community and we would love to hear from you. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. We'll be back once again next week. Until then, adios. Hey, listeners, thanks for journeying with us on this Next Man Up podcast. You know, we would love to hear from you. Maybe you have a question or an idea, perhaps a topic for us to consider. If that's you and you want to reach out to us, you can get us at feedback at the nextmanup.com. That's feedback at the nextmanup.com. Again, we'd love to hear from you. Until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you.